Hello, welcome to the Center for Collaborative Education's Rubric Design Module. I'm Lori Gagno, and I'll be taking you through the rubric design process. Rubrics are a central part of quality performance assessment design. Our goals for this module are to review the structure and value of rubrics, to consider the qualities that make a strong rubric, and participated in a structured design process. Because the rubric links the learning target with the student work, the language and design of the rubric can determine whether the rubric is ultimately successful or not. A well-designed rubric will not only describe success for the student, but also help guide the student getting there. Before going into what makes a good rubric, we'll go over the qualities of a rubric to be sure we're using the same terms. We tend to think of rubrics as scoring guides, but good rubrics work in a number of ways. As a teaching tool, they help students understand objectives. As an evaluation tool, they help teachers evaluate and compare ability levels, allowing teachers to see where specifically students may need support. Rubrics also help students and teachers see the progression of performance, distinguishing the variation across levels. Lastly, rubric criteria can be used for different elements from content to habits. The parts of the rubric are generally well understood, but sometimes people use different terms. Descriptors, for example, are sometimes called indicators. For us, the columns, proficient, advanced, etc., are called score levels. The criteria, or dimensions, are the learning targets being assessed, usually in the leftmost column of the rubric. The descriptors or indicators are the descriptions of evidence that will attest to achievement of the learning target. There are a number of types of rubrics. Each has its own advantages and disadvantages. The types of rubrics you will use is up to you, your team, and your leadership. Rubrics can be holistic or analytic. Holistic rubrics result in a single score, while analytic rubrics assess each of the learning targets separately. Rather than producing one score for an argumentative essay, for example, there are separate scores for idea development or supporting evidence. These won't necessarily be average or combined into one score. Rubrics can also be thought of as either test-specific or standards-based. A test-specific rubric is for a specific assessment addressing the learning targets of that assessment. A standards-based rubric will be written for a specific standard or competency. So if you write a rubric for idea development, then any assessment you give that assesses that learning target can use the rubric. Standards or competency-based rubrics are best designed at a team level, such as with your department or in your school or district. Rubrics have different kinds of criteria. In a complex performance assessment, all of these types may be used. Did you follow the right steps? Did you apply the correct rules and formats? Is the answer correct? Is the concept understood and correctly applied? Did the student use the processes to attain new knowledge, ask new questions? Did the product achieve its intended result? Ultimately, we want students to be demonstrating achievement at a depth of knowledge three or four level. Usually, the process form and accuracy criteria lead up to deeper thinking in new knowledge and impact. In the end, the appropriate level can be determined by looking at the language in the learning target itself. Think for a moment about the previous few slides. Take some time to write in your journal or discuss with your group the ideas you've seen and how they might reflect in your own work. Pause the video now and press play when you are ready to continue. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed reflecting on what you've learned so far. We've talked about what makes a rubric, but what makes a good rubric? We refer to these as quality criteria. What are the elements you have to look for in order to know that a rubric is strong. These are the criteria we'll be referring to later when tuning rubrics. 
First, we take a look at alignment. Ask yourself, is the rubric, especially the proficiency column, aligned with the intended learning target? Is it aligned both in terms of content and the level of cognitive rigor? Now, we'll look at the balance of criteria. Are the criteria types chosen appropriate for the Another aspect is about the coherence and focus. Do the, do the descriptors make sense both for the teacher and the students? You can ask yourselves the following questions. First, is the difference between a level two and three clear? Does it progress logically? Second, are the descriptions attainable by all students with the resources available? Is the language accessible? Third, does the rubric use asset-based language focusing on what students can do? rather than what they can't yet do. Fourth, does the rubric focus on the qualities of the work, such as effective elaboration of evidence, rather than using a certain quantity of evidence, such as using three quotes? Last, will the task produce visible evidence of learning as it's described in the rubric? There are other questions, but essentially you are asking does this set of descriptors make sense and will they elicit the evidence the student needs to produce in order to show attainment of the learning target? Finally, for a system of rubrics in the building or district, is there consistency of structure and practice? This isn't a quality of one rubric, but is shared across all of the rubrics of the department, building, or district. In order to ensure equity among students, it's vital that all students use similar rubric structures and share the same assumptions and procedures. This doesn't mean all rubrics have to be identical, but there should be agreed upon norms and assumptions around the design and use of rubrics for all students. Many choices around rubrics are up to the decisions of teachers or leaders. Some districts, for example, place proficiency at four rather than at three. This is fine as long as there is consistency for all students. Rubric design can feel both an art and a science. What follows is a procedure with steps that promote quality rubric design. The first step, of course, is to decide which learning target or targets you intend to assess. Next, think about what the learning target asks for and develop your criteria directly from the learning target. You may consider using the same language that you see in the learning target, compare or argue or persuade to ensure tight alignment. In a strong rubric, everything builds from the proficient column. Start there and work to make that as strong as possible before you expand outward. Having the agreement about what rubrics look like and why is the first step to being able to use them as an equitable learning tool. Here are some general tips for writing descriptors in a rubric. Sticking close to the language of the learning target is typically a good idea for maintaining tight alignment. This isn't to say you can't drift, but if you do so, you should know the reason you are doing it. For the second point, assessments are tools for gathering evidence of mastery, not for proving that the student has mastered the standard. Ultimately, you will have a system of assessments to support a determination of a student's mastery, but a single assessment can't do that alone. It's important that evidence called for in a rubric is tangible and observable by the teacher. This is especially true of habits or dispositions. For example, a series of correctly solved math problems is not in itself evidence of perseverance. Perseverance is the quality of maintaining effort in the face of adversity. There's not enough in the solved problems to speak to the amount of adversity encountered or the student's effectiveness in facing it. If you were intent on assessing perseverance and providing feedback to students, a better way to approach it would be through reflective writing by the student or an annotated portfolio of the work, which may give you a sense of the student's experience of the problem solving process. An important part of the rubric development process is to have your work tuned by peers. This is especially true for rubrics that may be used for common assessments. We've provided a rubric tuning tool and evidence gathering chart to help with this process. Since the entire rubric is built out from the proficiency column, it's a good idea to check this with your colleague before moving on. 
Many future challenges can be avoided if extra attention is paid to the proficiency column at this point in the process. After this initial review, move on to the column that's advanced beyond proficiency and developing right before proficiency and make sure there's coherence across the levels. Lastly, write any other column such as the beginning column. Then peer review the entire rubric. This time include the student directions in your review to make sure that the instructions students receive will lead to the work described in the rubric proficiency column. Once you've given the assessment, you can do another tuning using the actual student work. Finally, discuss the questions on this slide with your team. What went well? What are the implications for other parts of the design process and for instruction? What will you do next? For more resources or to dig deeper into this topic, please visit our website, explore the learning platform, or reach out to a member of the QPA team. Thank you so much from the Center for Collaborative Education. See you next time.